Let's go try us. Yes, Mr. Uh, well, when we broke for lunch, my lord, you, you'd thrown me a judicial curveball. Yes. Which I've spent the last hour trying to dodge. Um, I, I, I would say this, uh, as a caveat, um, the, the question your lordship has put to me is, of course, not an issue that arises directly for consideration in these proceedings. No. And therefore, it, it, it might be inappropriate to determine it or for me to make any concession on it at this point. But what I would say is this, in an effort to be helpful. <coughs> on the face of it, under section 114, taken with section 119 remedies, if a claim is brought alleging that the local authority at some point in the decision-making process has discriminated against an appellant, it would, under section 119, on the face of it, have the power to quash the discriminatory part so section 119 of what? The Equality Act? Of the Equality Act. That, uh, that section, well, I'm not sure we need to turn to it, simply says that in a section 114 claim, the county court has the same powers as the high court in a claim in tort or in a claim for judicial review. It's, it's located behind tab 3. Yeah. Towards the end of the tab. Yes. yes. Oh, I see. Yes. So, my lord, on the face of it, it, it would seem that it, it could only, in my submission, quash the discriminatory part of the process. It, it would be inappropriate in my submission for it to quash the review decision per se, because, of course, that is a jurisdiction which is afforded by statute to the county court in section 204P. But if, hypothetically, the county court in a 114 claim were to quash a discriminatory part of that process, which therefore vitiated the review decision, then in the 204 appeal, such consequences would flow from the 114 finding in accordance with its extent. Um, it, it may, hypothetically, there may be circumstances in which, although in a 114 claim, for example, a county court finds that part of the process was discriminatory, but it's nonetheless uh, pointless to set aside the review decision, for example, because um, since that time the applicant has become ineligible for assistance. Yeah, well, that would go to discretion. Do you it, would, it would go to discretion. Um, I mean, if, if an applicant for housing uh, yeah. says that she's been discriminated against in the review decision, what she wants is to be housed and to be to, for, the, for the decision to be well, for reconsidered. The decision to be yeah. Yes. And to go, go back to my Lord's example, yes. Um, Turkish applicant is refused on the ground there are too many Turks in the borough. It would be extraordinary if the county court couldn't quash that decision, wouldn't it? In what context, Lord? In well, in the... either con in the context, certainly, of section 119, which seems to say that the county court has power to grant any remedy that could be granted on a claim for judicial review, even though it doesn't have a formal judicial review jurisdiction. Yeah, but, but, but as I say, on the face of it, the powers would appear to be broad and wide, yeah. and arguably sufficiently wide to enable it to do that, but they would inevitably arise in, in certain cases arguments about uh, competing jurisdictions mm. um, and about a potential abuse of process by, for example, raising discrimination in one context rather than the other. Yeah. So, well, just before I move on, as a practical matter, for example, it would certainly be abusive if an, if an appellant did not bring their appeal within the 21-day time limit mm -hmm. under, under the 96 Act, it would be inappropriate for them to take advantage of the longer six-month limitation period under 114 yeah. and ask the county court to quash it in that circumstance. Oh, it may be that one doesn't need to go there, uh, Mr. Underwood. I think there are, there are provisions, aren't there, in, in the relevant part of the Housing Act, Interim relief. Yes. So, in the 
in the example I give of the of the Turkish applicant for housing, the original decision, review decision, say too many Turks in the borough, you lose. Yeah. Um, the applicant brings the section 204 appeal, but is also advised that if you're right about the jurisdiction point, she has to make a Equality Act claim in the county court. Um, the county court judge at the hearing, or maybe even the directions hearing of the section 204 appeal, says, well, this is very interesting. I'm going to adjourn the section 204 appeal until after the um, Equality Act case is heard. Yes. I, I will hear it with assessors in three weeks' time, and then we'll see where um, where the council is on the section 204 appeal. Yes. I mean, I, I, that's just a thought that the the uh, apparent absurdity of there being two um, separate jurisdictions would probably in real life be dealt with. Indeed, in practical terms, it would, I'm sure, be dealt with, uh, as your Lordship has pointed out. So, al although hypothetically we may <clears throat> we may raise some concerns about what has been termed the multiplicity of proceedings, in practice, it, it's it's likely to be manageable. Um, my Lord, um, I know that uh, uh, my Lord, um, Lord Justice being wanted to, or, or interrupted me when I was dealing with the point of Michelac, we got to the point, my Lord, when I, I was saying that there, there are dicta in Michelac which say that actually the supervisory role of the county court, or in fact in that case, um, the immigration, uh, the employment tribunal, is simply not or rather judicial review, is simply not adequate to deal with the complex analysis required to determine a discrimination claim. Um, if, if I can take you to tab 21. Your Lordships may be familiar with this case. This was a case in which um, a claimant brought a case before the employment tribunal and argued that the way in which the GMC had handled um, fitness to practice proceedings against her and the way in which it investigated her own complaints about other practitioners had discriminated against her, both on grounds of sex, race and indeed disability. The question arose as to whether the employment tribunal had jurisdiction to entertain that claim. And it all turned, as you'll see, my lords, from paragraph 13. On whether, <clears throat> within the meaning of section 120 of the 2010 Act, an appeal before the Employment Tribunal could be said to be, or rather judicial review, I, take, I beg your pardon, could be said to be of the nature of an appeal such as to oust the jurisdiction of the Employment Tribunal. And in this case, the Lordships decided and affirmed that it could not be of the nature of an appeal. And in doing so, they highlighted the inadequacy of judicial review in determining discrimination claims. Paragraphs 21 and 22 I'll spare your Lordships the need to listen to me uh, rehearse them. If, could I ask your Lordship to read 21 and 
my Lord, before we leave that authority, paragraph 29 essentially makes the same point, that what is required to, determination, uh, to determine a discrimination claim is a scrupulous inquiry on the facts. Yes. But may I move so the up? upshot is that the employment tribunal had jurisdiction. My Lord, I was also dealing with the point about multiplicity of proceedings, and I'd got to a certain point in, in the submissions I was making. I omitted to make two further. I think I was answering your Lordship's question. <laughs> um, if, if I may briefly pause and deal with that for a moment. I, I've covered the fact that actually the number of such issues arising is likely to be small. For the reasons I think. There, are, there are two further points, and that is it, it would be wholly inappropriate for the county court uh, to deal with those issues together in the same proceedings. And the reason I say that is because there are such procedural and evidential, if I can call it that, differences between the way in which the county court determines a discrimination claim on the one hand and an appeal on the other. That to do them both together would risk um, making errors of law, straying into one jurisdiction rather than the other. The, I'll give two examples. Uh, in, a, in a Section 204 appeal, the burden is squarely with the appellant. It is for them to satisfy the court that the review officer made an error of law. In a discrimination claim under Section 136, if there is sufficient evidence of discrimination to raise a prima facie case, the burden shifts to the defendant to prove that there was no such discrimination. So you have entirely different burdens of proof. In a claim required to determine discrimination, my lords, there would be a need, because it's such a fact-sensitive inquiry, there would be a need for statements of case, disclosure, inspection, um, statements of fact, cross-examination. And that is simply something that procedurally is not open to the county court in a Section 204 appeal. Uh, may I take you briefly to Bub, behind tab 14, paragraph 24. Uh, where His Lordship, Lord Newberger, highlights some of the difficulties that would arise were the county court to admit evidence in a 204 appeal. Uh, it's tab 14, my lord. 14. Um, 14. Sorry, 24. But this, this is the passage that uh, Mr. Davis read to us. Yes, you looked at that. Yeah. Y yes, and it, it, it highlights one of the, pr the practical reason and the, pr the reasons in principle why the court should not admit or be careful not to admit evidence because there is a risk of making errors of law and making findings in the 204 appeal that the judge is simply not entitled to make. Yeah. You have the point. Lastly, before I move on, the need for a separate claim is absolutely fundamental, we say, to protect the rights of the defendant under Article 6. And so, for example, a Part 7 claim will afford a defendant protections that a Part 52 appeal, Section 204 appeal, simply cannot afford. Mm -hmm. So, for example, as the learned judge found below, statements of case the ability to ask Part 18 questions in response to them, disclosure, inspection, statements of case, statements of fact rather, cross-examination, and the ability to apply for summary judgment. None of those ordinarily available under Part 52. That's why this has to be dealt with separately. I'm grateful for your indulgence on that. Um, no, I was just thinking that the cases say, don't they, that decision on a homelessness application does not engage Article 6 because it's not determining the applicant's civil rights. On, on a homelessness application? So the, what you're really saying is that once discrimination comes into the picture as an allegation against 
the housing authority or the reviewing officer, then it does engage Article 6 because the determination of a discrimination claim is the determination of a civil right. So you're into it, you're, you're as it were, moving into a completely different sphere of, of the law. Is that really what you're saying? It, it, it engages the Article 6 rights of... I, I probably don't need to go that far. The simple point is, Part 7 offers procedural yeah. uh, protections that Part 52 doesn't offer. Um, and that's why there's a need to deal with it separately. Uh, my Lord, I need to address my learned friend's reliance on Adith Yisrael, and I can do so briefly. Uh, it, it may assist for us to take a look at the decision as we do it. But I can make my points, two full points, very shortly. Well, there was jurisdiction in that case, because it was a judicial review. It, the, the decision to that effect is inconsistent in our submission with this court's finding in Hamlet. The, the, in in Hamlet. Hamlet. Yeah. My Lord, the, the claim made in Adith Yisrael, if, as I say, if we, if we can turn to it at... Tab, 20, tab 25. Well, it's the same judge. Yeah. <clears throat> from, the, from the top of, of the head notes, you'll see that the claim that was brought in Adith Israel was a claim of indirect discrimination brought under Section 29 in the provision of public services. Exactly the same type of claim as was brought in Hamlet as was brought in Summers. And of course, in Hamlet and in Summers, uh, Lord Justice Gross, with whom the rest of the court agreed, and in Summers, Mrs. Justice May, decided categorically the county court has jurisdiction to mm. determine these claims. No, I don't think so, with respect. <clears throat> what happened in Adar <clears throat> Israel, <clears throat> you can see from page 254, is that it was a claim for judicial review by a judicial review claim form yes. with permission and the relief sought was judicial review of the decision of the coroner. So because the Equality Act permits proceedings to be brought, brought by way of judicial review, the High Court, or the Administrative Court rather, had jurisdiction. What Hamlet decides is that a statutory review available under the Road Traffic Act, whichever it was, is not the same as judicial review. There's nothing inconsistent between the two, because Adat Yisrael was a judicial review claim. So, as Lord Justice Singh pointed out, the court had jurisdiction, because the Act says it does. Uh, I see what your Lordship says. Uh, let, let me rely upon my second point in that case. The second point is that, in any event, it's clearly distinguishable on the premise that the reason the court could proceed by way of judicial review in that case was precisely because there were no disputed facts. Yeah. Well, I had jurisdiction. Yeah. Well, I, I can't see w what other type of litigation would have worked. This was a, this was a challenge to a policy. Mm -hmm. um, the policy was... Crazy for a whole lot, a whole lot of reasons, one of which was discrimination. I, I'm with your lordship. <laughs> yeah. I'm with your lordship. It, it, I, I simply make the second point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm grateful. Right. That probably brings me to the end of the Equality Act issue. Um, in which case, uh, that leaves me with the second limb of the track, the Housing Act issue. Yeah. And I hope, my lords, given the time, to be able to deal with this somewhat more briefly. Right. Um, the reason for that, Lord, is that uh, we have made detailed uh, representations in response to the EHRC's submissions. Mm -hmm. And there is only one aspect in which I wish to um, develop those submissions orally. Accordingly, subject to any questions your Lordships might have about the submissions we've made, uh, I, I would limit my oral submissions to that extent. By way of Thoroughness, your lordships will know our case is yeah. CN does not affect the set of law. The only thing that CN decides, the only thing it decides, it is that a section 204 appeal is the, the other place to which Lord Kerr refers in paragraph 71, 
or within the meaning of Section 7.1 of the Human Rights Act, the legal proceedings in which the occupier of temporary accommodation under Section 1883.2044 could raise the alleged disproportionality of their eviction from that accommodation. But in, in deciding facts relevant to the proportionality of that eviction, it is not the Section 204 jurisdiction the court is exercising, but it's jurisdiction under Section 7. And we rely to that end on the application by Lord Kerr of paragraphs 75 to 80 of the Supreme Court's decision in Pinnock. In what? In Pinnock? In Pinnock. Sorry, which paragraphs again? 75? 75 to 80, and my Lord, um, paragraph 80 in particular, which says that section 71B, in the context of a claim for possession against a demoted tenant, gave the county court in possession proceedings the jurisdiction to deal with the issue of proportionality. And that's precisely what the county court is doing in the two or four context. Could you just take us to those? I'm sure my Lord Lord Justice Lewison knows by heart the paragraphs you've just referred to, but you've quite rightly compressed it, but I, I'd like to see it on the on the printed page. Of course, Lord. So is it, is it, of course. Mm -hmm. Is it Pinnock you would like me to refer to? Um, well, you say that in it can be seen from CN oh, and yes. the application in CN of certain paragraphs of Pinnock, yep. um, that, etc. So, my Lord, CN is... I'm not familiar is, with either of those things. Mm -hmm. I'm still Lord, so if you want to take it to me. Of course. Let me understand. On tab 16, my Lord, yes. yeah. uh, you'll find the decision of CN. ourselves <clears throat> for today's purposes with paragraph 71 which appears at page 1309. Yes. Uh, very briefly my lord this was a case which um, raised two issues first of all in evicting an occupier from temporary accommodation provided to a homeless person was the local authority required to bring possession proceedings under section 3 of the protection from eviction act 77 and if they weren't, was evicting the occupier without a possession order a breach of their rights under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights? Was it a simple re physical repossession? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, the Supreme Court decided no possession proceedings were required, but also on the second issue, there would be no breach of Article 8 rights. And paragraph 71 is part of their Lordship's reasoning on that point. The re one of the reasons it decided there would be no breach is because there were already sufficient safeguards for the Article 8 rights in uh, domestic law. So one of them, Lord, uh, uh, Lord Kerr says, is the ability to bring a claim for a judicial review. Uh, 71 is Lord Hodge, is it? Yeah. Wanting to look at Lord Kerr? I, I, no, no, I'm so sorry. Lord Hodge. Yeah. My mistake. Um, one of those safeguards was the ability to bring a claim for judicial review. Uh, the other, they said, was that they could interpret Section 204 of the Housing Act 96 to enable the county court judge in the context of that statutory appeal to assess the proportionality of the occupier's eviction. Just, can you just explain how that comes about? The, the, the applicant applies for homelessness assistance, yes. the authority accommodates her in temporary accommodation, yes. which doesn't count as a dwelling, so the Supreme Court says. Well, there we are, that's what they decided. Therefore, it follows that in order to chuck the applicant out of the temporary accommodation, the authority don't need to take proceedings. Yes. What is the Section 204 right of appeal against that decision? Well, <clears throat> uh, one, one might say, respectfully, it is a remedy without any teeth. Well, what is the decision that's being... The, well, the, deci the decision that would be challenged is, uh, take a hypothetical example. Um, uh, an, an applicant requests a review of a, a, an original decision. <clears throat> Local authority decides to accommodate them pending review. They make an adverse review decision, and as a consequence of that review decision, they say... We are ending your temporary accommodation. Right. 
applicant then makes a 204 appeal to the county court. Against? Against the review decision. But in that context, applying Lord Hodge's dicta, in principle, would also be able to raise the alleged disproportionality of their eviction from that temporary accommodation in the context of the 204 appeal. That is the only circumstance in which that scenario actually works. I see that comes within Section 204. Well, that's, that's my point. Is there is no way of construing Section 204.1 in order to bring <coughs> the applicant's right to do that before the county court in a Section 204 appeal. So the only logical explanation is that, therefore, their lordships cannot possibly have been saying that it was the 204 jurisdiction that the county court was exercising in that process. The jurisdiction that they are exercising, we say it's explicit, explicable on this basis, but Lord Hodge expressly applies the reasoning in Pinnock. And Pinnock is decided on the premise that one of the reasons why the occupier is entitled to raise the Article 8 proportionality of their eviction from their own home in the context of a claim against the demoted tenant was because Section 7.1b gave the county court the jurisdiction to determine that issue. And what is noticeable about this decision in CA, their lordships considered none of the authorities on the fact-finding jurisdiction no. of the county court. So it can't possibly have been the case that their lordships were redeciding but. It can't possibly be that. It wasn't even cited. Wasn't cited. It's not as though either Mr. Arden QC for the appellants or, or Lord Newberger, who presided in both cases, had never heard of it. it indeed. indeed. It, it wasn't cited. It wasn't argued. There was no consideration at all given to existing authority on the limits of the county court's 204 jurisdiction. And the, the inevitable consequence of that, I, I would not be so bold as to say his lordship got it wrong. Uh, I don't need to. Is it ratio? Are we bound by it? <clears throat> we, we have taken the view that it is, because it is part of his lordship's reasoning as to why there is no breach of article 8. Right. But... My Lord, it is explicable. And may I may I do so by reference to Pinner? Because you'll see from paragraph 71, <clears throat> his lordship says the decisions of this court in 2011 in Pinnock and Powell uh, extended the powers of the county courts essentially to, to consider Article 8 in the context of possession proceedings. And it is on that basis that he says this issue can be raised in a 204 appeal. But my Lord Pinner appears at tab 13. I'm sorry before we go there. Can I, I just wanted to see if I can understand what it is that Lord Hodge is saying. Um, he starts at 69. Yes. Uh, you have to remind me, what is section 184? Section 184 is the um, uh, the local authority's decision-making function. Okay, and that then brings in 202, does it? 202 is the review? Yeah. Yep. 202 doesn't mention 184.
better. It does bring in 202 and then you get into 204 that way. Yes. Uh, I, I should probably say, in case this case goes any further, I would reserve my position as to whether in fact 71 was correctly decided. But I don't think this court needs to find, or indeed can, it can find, that it wasn't. I don't think it needs to. Um, as I say, the rationale for paragraph 71 it is the decision in Pinnock and Powell. And if I may take your lordship to that, is this a convenient point? Yes, yep, maybe uh, just make sure I've got the measure of this case. The, the Supreme Court held that where um, the claimant or applicant is housed in temporary accommodation as a homeless person. Yes. Um, the, lo the good news for the local authority is they don't have to bring a possession claim. Correct. The bad news is that their adverse decision can be subject to an application for judicial review if permission is granted. And on that judicial review, um, the six issues, the various issues enumerated by Lord Hodge are up for grabs, including what's in section 71, uh, uh, paragraph 71. Yes, so, so the bad news, as your Lordship put it, is that although the local authority does not need to bring possession proceedings, the occupier could none, nonetheless um, if you like, stave them off by bringing in a 204 appeal context an allegation that the proposed eviction from that accommodation would be disproportionate within the meaning of Article 8. And the reason the Commission relies on that is because, of course, in paragraph 71, Lord Hodge goes on to say that in that context, in making the proportionality assessment, the county court could um, resolve any relevant disputes of fact that is relevant to the proportionality, the Article 8 proportionality of an eviction. And so the Commission says, well, look, county court can do that, so surely it can also make findings of fact in the context of discrimination. And we say, no. That just just get the practicalities of this, this is a case deciding whether you need to bring a possession, possession action or not. Yeah. So the authority doesn't have to do that. So what's it done? These proceedings come, uh, uh, arise in the context of the the, the occupant having been somehow got out, locked out of the premises, and a complaint is made. Is that what happens, or is it no, the person still in occupation? It, it's the step prior to that. In order, in order for this issue to arise, in reality, the occupier would still have to be in occupation. So an eviction would not have taken place. Now it's quite conceivable the local authority would say you've got 48 hours to get out and carry out the eviction themselves in accordance with issue one in CA. Well, just, just throw the, the occupant out physically? Yes. Yep. In which case, it's too late. There is, there, there is no issue to raise in, in, in either context. But if that occupier is still in occupation at the point of his or her appeal, relying on 71, you've got a point. Thank you. But uh, 69... The authority must give written notice and uh, a reasonable period of notice to vacate and the applicant is entitled to have the adverse decision reviewed and then the decision on review can be appealed to the county court. But, but not the decision to evict. It's the review decision on the homelessness application that is subject to review and scrutiny in that way. Yeah, that's where I don't quite follow the reasoning. Because the, the decision under Section 184... Yes. Is ...what duty does the local authority, the local housing authority, owe to the applicant? Yes. And on the facts of N... They said, we owe you a duty to advise only because you've become intentionally homeless. Well, yes. So that you can review. Yes. But I can't at the moment see that there is anywhere that says that you're entitled to a review 
of a subsequent decision to evict. It, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. All, all it says, all, all it says in my submission is this, that, uh, and your Lordship is entirely right in my respectful submission, the fact that there is a review um, prior to the appeal is, is of no matter, because it doesn't entitle the occupier in that context to raise the alleged proportionality of, of, um, of their eviction. The matters on which, in respect of which uh, an applicant may seek a review, I think your Lordship has looked at the provision, are set out in section 202, mm. and they do not include the proportionality of your eviction from temporary accommodation. So all that this is saying is that, look, Occupy, if you happen to still be in occupation at the time that you bring your appeal, well, that appeal is the, appro the, the other place to which Lord Hodge refers, or as, as we will see in a moment, the legal proceedings within Section 7, in which you can raise the proportionality of your eviction. Now, in reality, is that likely to happen? Probably not. As, as I think um, my Lord, Lord Justice McComb has pointed out, in reality, because issue one was decided against the occupier and there's no need for a possession order, the reality is that occupier will be out before they bring their 204 appeal. But if they're not, section uh, paragraph 71 would in principle entitle them to raise that issue before the court. Yes. But, but what it does not decide and what it does not say is that in resolving issues of fact relevant to the Article 8 proportionality of an eviction, that it is the Section 204 jurisdiction the County Court is exercising. It is not. And for that, I, I take your Lordships to Pinnock. Tab 13. And I referred earlier to paragraphs 75 to 80, my Lord, <coughs> which appear at pages 131 to 132 of the judgment. their Lordships dealt was whether section 143D of the Housing Act 96 gave the court a jurisdiction to consider the Article 8 proportionality of evicting a demoted tenant from his or her home. And 143D in summary is couched in terms that provided the local authority complies with a prescribed statutory procedure, notice, review, etc., as long as it's done that lawfully, then the court must make a possession order. And so it was said, given, given the strictness of those provisions, there was no scope statutorily for the county court to undertake the proportionality exercise. Their lordship said, no, paragraph 80. This approach to the interpretation of section 143D goes a long way to disposing of Mr Arden's argument Even if Article 8 required the kind of review, that kind of review, the county court didn't have the jurisdiction. The answer to that was it did because of Section 71B. And that is the reasoning in my submission that Lord Hodge is applying in paragraph 71 of CN. He's not saying, and, and it would be strange if he were saying, that Bob is no longer good law, there is a fact-finding jurisdiction, because, uh, as my Lord Lord Justice being pointed out... Are you saying it's for special considerations uh, under the human rights legislation? It is. That uh, requires this uh, interpretation of the procedure or the facility available to the courts to deal with these issues? Because yes. Because the court has to intervene to make the Human Rights Act and the Convention work. But no. It doesn't apply, as, I suppose you, you're saying, to the discrimination legislation. Is that right? Uh, uh, correct. We, we, we do say that. So, that, so the, the CN decision, whatever it says, if you're submitting, as I understand it, doesn't apply to the case that's being made against you by Ms. Davis, that uh, these issues are all up for play in the county court on 204 appeal, I mean, the Equality yes. Act issue. That, that, point, 
that, that's the point I wanted to develop separately. Right. Uh, so, so you, you have my submissions on CN. Yep. I, I say it, it doesn't do what the Commission says. Um, it, even if I'm wrong on that, Lords, the only thing it decides is that in the context of an, the, the alleged disproportionality of an eviction, there is that fact, limited fact-finding scope. What the Commission says is because that jurisdiction exists, then it must be right. There is no logical reason, they say, yeah. why the county court could not also engage in fact-finding in order to determine a discrimination claim. With the greatest of respect, we say that is way too far a leap. And <clears throat> if I may just have a brief moment. We offer two prongs of attack on that point. Well, one, a practical point, and two, a point in principle. Uh, the, the point of practice is this, and I'll, I'll give you two examples. Uh, the, the findings of fact required to determine the proportionality of Article 8 uh, rights are significantly, significantly and manifestly different from the findings of fact that would be necessary to determine a discrimination claim. And so Article 8 proportionality, when it's raised, as we know from Pinnock and we know from Thurrock and West subsequently, rests only upon the occupier's personal circumstances. So the only issues of fact that would arise, if ever, would concern personal circumstances. And the assessment of proportionality under Article 8 proceeds on a presumed basis. It proceeds on the basis of facts as they are alleged by the occupant. So there is no, in most cases, no material dispute of fact. Uh, I can make that good. I probably, I don't want to take up time by referring to the passage in Pinnock. Paragraph 53, however, makes the point that the, proportion, the Article 8 proportionality exercise is based on only on the occupier's personal circumstances and proceeds on the basis simply of the facts they assert. Is that right? So I thought Pinnock said that if on the basis of the facts alleged by the occupier you can determine that there is no valid defence, you deal with it summarily. But if on the facts alleged by the occupier there is or might be, and those facts are disputed, then you'd have to go to trial, wouldn't you? In the ordinary way. That's a fair point. <laughs> That's a fair point. Because um, let, let, let me reflect. Pinnock and Thurrock say, if you can deal with this summarily, because even on the occupier's best case there's no defence, then that's what you should do. Yes. My lord, my lord makes a fair point. But, but it does raise another point of substance, which, which is this. When Article 8 proportionality is raised, we know, as your lordship has just pointed out, that in many cases, especially, my lord, in a case like this where there is no security of tenure, the court will deal with it summarily. That is not possible, apart from in rare cases, in respect of Section 15 proportionality. Mm. And that point, my lord, is made by both Lord Newberger and Lady Hale, Baroness Hale, I beg your pardon, in Astor Communities. Yeah. That save where it's obvious that they, um, that they are not disabled, or say where it is absolutely clear that the action taken by the landlord is proportionate, every case will need a fact-sensitive trial. Mm. So there's a fundamental difference, and there is, a, it's, as I say, it's a far leap. Uh, the points of principle that we raise are these. Uh, the submission made by, by the Commission ignores the rationale for deciding paragraph 71 of CN as the Supreme Court did. Your Lordships have seen paragraph 71, and in that case, the need to interpret section 204 in the way that the Supreme Court did arose from the fact that there was, in Lord Hodge's words, no other place in which the occupier could properly raise that issue, apart from, for example, judicial review. Well, that's not the case here. There is a remedy, section 114, section 113. So there is absolutely no need to interpret section 204 in the way the Commission says, to include a fact-finding jurisdiction that is wholly inconsistent 
with a long line of established authority. That assumes that um, if you've got Section 204 proceedings on foot and this discussion we had before, a yeah. short adjournment, that you can bring along a, a, a suitable Equality Act proceedings in parallel yeah. to have any discrimination issues resolved. Yes, yeah. that assumes that. It, it, it does. Uh, the further point I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong, but that does make that assumption, doesn't it? I think it does, my lord, yeah. Okay. My lord, the further point of principle is this. In order for the Commission to be right about the County Court's ability to determine discrimination claims in the context of a 204, it must necessarily adopt the appellant's position, and does in fact adopt the appellant's position, that it is possible to interpret Section 1133 of the Equality Act so that judicial review includes a Section 204 yeah. appeal, and that is foreclosed by authority. So, for those reasons, the Commission's submissions, respectfully, simply do not work. Right. Right. My Lord, I think I've exhausted round one. Yeah. Um, in which case, I hope to deal... Uh, I leave you with my written submissions on round one, uh, insofar as I've not developed them orally. I hope to deal with round two a little more briefly. Just if we go on to round two. Judge Luber said that the first point is determinative. Well, it, it is. If, if you decide, if you, the, in order to succeed in this appeal, the appellant has to win on both grounds. If you decide in my favour on ground one, arguably ground two doesn't arise. But it does raise an important point of principle, and it would be proper for this court to determine it nonetheless. My Lord, by ground two, we say with the greatest of respect that the decision reached by <clears throat> Mr Justice Jay in Tashi, interpreting the uh, statutory formula point of law arising from the review decision, is unduly expansive and is not warranted upon a proper construction of the, statu of the statute. Uh, as your Lordships will know, there are only two reported decisions on this point. There is Tashi itself, in which Mr Justice Jay held in short that there was no merit in a restrictive interpretation of that, that formula. And of course there is uh, Paniotu, Haringey and Smith, in which my Lord, Lord Justice Lewison expressed, shall I say, doubts about the, the propriety of that finding. With the greatest of respect, we adopt your Lordships disquiet and concern, and we say by way of headline submission that section 204.1, uh, and this is picked up, my lords, if you wish to follow the argument, <coughs> at paragraph 95 of my first skeleton argument, yeah. we say <coughs> section 204.1 entitles an ap applicant to ground an appeal on errors of law that are made, A, uh, after the local housing authority receives a request for a review, and before or at the point that it notifies the, <clears throat> the applicant of its decision, and B, by the officer who is conducting that review. What it does not do, and this is our attack on the decision in Tashi, what it does not do is permit a collateral attack on decisions taken by the local authority, taken A, before there was any such request for review, temporarily, indeed made by other officers, that is, other than the review officer. That seemed to be what Abbott was saying. Yes. Yes. It is, it is supported also by Dicta, <coughs> paragraph 55 in William and Wandsworth. May I take your Lordship to that briefly in a moment? Mm. Because before I take you to that point, may I um, go back to, the, back to the beginning, as it were, to section 204 itself. <coughs> yeah. So, tab... Hmm? Yeah, probably. Well, tab 2 sets out the provisions of the 96 Act. I go through them sequentially. 
So section 202 first, which establishes and enacts the applicant's right to request a review of certain decisions of the local authority. And one can see there that the obligation to undertake a review only arises once there has been a request. I take that, my lords, from subsection 3 of section 202 and subsection 4. Yeah. That's what I was curious about this section 184 because it's not listed there, but it does, it does require the authority to decide whether any duty, and if so, what duty is owed to him. Yes, and, and one can appeal a decision as to what, do, oh, sorry, one can request a review yeah. of what duty, if any, is owed under Section 202. Yeah. But the, the brief point I make, uh, I make here, as I have in the written submissions, it, is, look, there is a clear contradistinction in Section 204 to which we'll come between the review decision and the points of law that arise from that, and points of law that arise from other decisions. And the points of law which, on which an, uh, an appellant may ground a 204 appeal must therefore, logically, and on the plain meaning of the statute, be referable to the review decision and process. And uh, that process begins with the request for a review. It ends under section 204, I beg your pardon, Section 203, subsection 5. Sorry, section 203. Yes, if you turn over the page, we'll look section 203. I beg your pardon, it's subsection 3. The authority, or as the case may be, either of the authorities shall notify the applicant of the, of the decision on review. So the review process spans that period between request and notification. And we say it's a very simple, but we hope attractive argument that logically, therefore, the points of law on which an appellant may ground a Section 204 appeal must be referable to that period of time and not to decisions taken prior to that, temporarily. And, and that is borne out by a passage, by Section 204 itself, turning over the page, in which, under subsection 1, the right to appeal against the local authority's original decision is foreclosed to an applicant once the local authority has notified him or her of their review decision. And what follows logically and on the plain meaning of that section is that once the local authority has notified that decision, it is not possible for the applicant to raise any issues of law, errors of law, that arise from a period prior to the request. Uh, and if at this point, my lords, I may take you to William and Wandsworth, tab 7 of the authorities bundle. My lord is right to say that it is it's a point that is covered by the case to which Lord Justice Lewison referred earlier, the case of Abbott, but paragraph 55 also makes this clear. the local authority notifies the applicant of its decision. Section 204 focuses its attention on the period of time between request and notification, on nothing else. That is clearly the, stat the parliamentary intent uh, behind the 96 Act. That is clearly the statutory objective. And so if your lordships are with me on that simple analysis, it rules out the type of question that, with respect, Mr Justice Jay incorrectly permitted to be raised in passion. And we would invite your Lordship not to follow that decision and to decide in accordance with our analysis. If, if, the, if there's been no notification of the decision by the... Uh, if not notified of the decision on the review, then there can be 
Yes, my lord, and, but importantly, and logically again, that's, that appeal against the original decision would focus on the period of time between the making of an application which engages the local authority and the original decision itself. Nothing afterwards, nothing before. And, and with, 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 again, with respect, that, that is an analysis in which Mr Justice Jay did not engage in Tashi. What does it mean for this case? Inevitably, we say, it means that the points of law that the appellant proposed to take in these proceedings simply do not arise from this review decision. They relate to a point in time, not just before the review decision, but before the original. Would it have been open to the appellant in this case to have said to the reviewing officer, um, your officer didn't give me enough time in which to make up my mind about uh, the offered accommodation. And that's my complaint. There, there's nothing to stop her saying that. She could have said it. Um, the review officer could have decided the point. The, yeah. point, the point made by your lordship previously, we, we say is a strong point. On the facts, and I, I won't take you back through them, it's simply this. She asked for more time on the 25th. I beg your pardon. Ms. Adesoto asked for more time on the 25th. She was given it, or, or at least she had it. Thereafter, not once, not once did she say she'd had insufficient time. Not once, whether it be in the request for review, in the nurse's letter, any other circumstance, did she say, I haven't had enough time. I wanted more time to consider the decision to take legal advice, etc., etc. Not once. And that's why ground five of this appeal marries with ground two. Because the inability of this appellant to raise this point in the 204 appeal arises as much from the fact that her points do not arise out of the review decision as they are barred by crap. And briefly on that point, the reliance of, on Pieretti in this case is misplaced. It cannot possibly be said on the facts of this case that her requirement or apparent need for further time to make a decision was something so obvious that this review officer should have considered it nonetheless. It's simply not arguable on the facts because she never mentioned it. And so, my lords, that, that, that is our simple argument but I hope, as I say, attractive argument on grounds two, three, and five. Yes, we say, strictly, his, his honour was bound by the decision in Tashi, but he was right not to follow it. Uh, having difficulty seeing how Pieretti really advanced the case, but the point in Pieretti was that, that without considering whether Mr. and Mrs. Pieretti were or weren't disabled, the reviewing officer said they were, home, they were uh, intentionally homeless. And this court said, no, he should have considered whether there was a disability. And if he thought there was, then maybe he should have made reasonable adjustments or some such. Yeah. But the reviewing officer in this case did consider whether um, Miss Adesotu yeah. was or wasn't disabled yes. and decided she wasn't. Yes, yes, quite. But, but in, the, in material respects, can I, does your lordship have Pieretti open yeah. in front of him now? Paragraph 33 is opposite, is it not? Which tab is? Uh, uh, sorry, my lord, behind tab 12. Thank you. So there, there is a heavy caveat to the dicta in uh, paragraph 32. His lordship says, the law does not require that in every case decision makers under 184 or 202 must take active steps to inquire into whether the person to be subject to the decision is disabled and if so, is disabled in a way relevant to the decision. That would be absurd. Well, so it would be in this case. Well, except the reviewing officer did consider the question. Well, n not specifically the extra time. Well, not that particular aspect of it. But, but that, that's the complaint here, my lord. Yeah. Uh, and it, given that it was never raised, it would, in, in the words of this court, be truly absurd to suggest that that review officer should have considered the alleged need for further time when she never suggested it was necessary. 
My lords, I said I would leave you with my written submissions on form six. Unless I can assist you further, those are my submissions. Right. Do you want to say anything about Abed or not? Uh, oh, I, I do beg your pardon, yes. I, I can deal with it briefly. It, it supports our analysis on the temporal distinction. On the temporal, well, I beg you, on the temporal limitation yeah. of points that can properly be taken on a 204 appeal. And so, coupled with William and Wandsworth, it provides cogent support to our analysis. I'm grateful. Thank you very much. Yes, Ms Davis. My words, I'll be short. Um, on ground one, first of all, I have three points. Um, which, which of these, and then I'll turn to Abid under ground two. Briefly on CN, we, we don't adopt the HRC's position. Um, we, our view on fact-finding is much more limited. You've heard my submissions on, on that. But all I would say and, and draw your attention to is when we look at paragraph 71 of CN, which is behind tab 16, my learned friends... It is certainly right that these remarks by Lord Hodge were not in the context of the careful consideration of the homelessness, Section 204 authorities. That's, that's certainly the case. They're in the context of the authorities under the Protection from Eviction Act. Where, where, where does the right to have a review of the local authority's decision to evict there is no such right. So the Supreme Court just invented that, didn't they? Um, well, <laughs> either they invented it or it's, it's, it's an illusion. There's, there's a right of review of the decision that no duty is owed or only yes. the limited duty to advise. That, yes, I see that. that's right. But 70, <coughs> Para 71 is talking about the proportionality of the eviction. Now, it's presumably perfectly possible for a local authority to say... We don't owe you, owe you any duty, but we're not going to evict you. It would be extraordinary in this day and age. But in this day and age, I agree, because there's well, so much demand. But, I mean, as a matter of legality... Probably acting ultra virus. That would be the difficulty. Um, they probably don't have a power to do that. There are some very broad powers. So if it fell within yeah. various broad but powers... Well, I think well, where I'm getting to is the decision to evict is a different decision. It is different. It, and there is no but, statutory process for challenging it. So the Supreme Court made it up. Well, the Supreme Court, when, when, when my Lord looks at paragraph 71, the second sentence, it appears to me it's necessary for the same reason... Uh, that's the reference to pinnacle and proportionality, to interpret section 204 of the 996 Act as empowering that court to assess the issue of proportionality of proposed eviction following an adverse section 184 or 202 decision, brackets if the issue is raised and resolved any relevant dispute of fact in section 204. Now, as I read that, <coughs> my lords, then what Lord Hodge is saying is that you have a 184 decision on what duty is owed, which is adverse. For example, you don't have a priority need, so we have no duty to accommodate you. You request a review, so that goes to the 202 stage. Following that 202, you may, if there is an error of law, or an, argument, an alleged error of law, appeal under 204. At any point from the 184 decision onwards, you, are, you receive a notice of eviction, you cannot challenge that directly except through judicial review. You cannot challenge that directly, but if you have activated your 202 and 204 process about the no priority need decision, then, as Mr Underwood said, when you get into the 204 process, if you are still in your property, then you can, says the Supreme Court, raise the issue of proportionality in, the, in, that, in that decision about priority need. Right, and if the local authority says we're not going to do anything until the county court has determined your section 204 appeal, we're not going to decide what to do. Because you may be right, you may, you may be entitled to carry on, so we're not going to decide anything. And the county court dismisses the 204 appeal, then the local authority says, right, we're now going to evict you, 
Your only remedy would be judicial review. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, my Lord, Mr. Underwood said that it was ratio. It may well be ratio. I don't see to go behind that, but it was certainly not. There was certainly not much consideration to the background given before Lord Hodge came up with that. All I would say about that paragraph, if we um, read on, Mr Underwood very elegantly um, dis inter submitted that the right interpretation is that the only fact-finding within e either of judicial review or section 204 could be in relation to the proportionality of the evictions. I say that that's not how the last two, the, the third and fourth sentences of that paragraph read, as there is no other domestic provision involving the court in the repossession of the accommodation after an adverse decision. The section 204 appeal, which reviews the authority decision on eligibility for assistance, or priority need, or so forth, is the obvious place for the occupier of a temporary accommodation to raise the issue of the proportionality of the withdrawal of the accommodation alternative Alternatively, as Lord Justice Moses stated, the occupier of the temporary accommodation may raise the issue of proportionality of such an eviction by way of judicial review in the administrative court, which similarly could resolve relevant factual disputes. It may be, and as I say, this is the ECHR's case and it's the EHRC's case and it's not mine, um, that the words similarly could resolve relevant factual disputes does mean that both the administrative court and the Section 204 Court have a fact-finding jurisdiction within which proportionality could apply, but aren't necessarily limited to proportionality. In answer to my question, I think Mr. Underwood said that uh, this was a sort of special, special construct to deal with the obligations under the Human Rights Act. Mm. You mm. Don't you accept that? I'm saying that it's not clear either way from that paragraph and that one could, I understood his, his, his argument, I'm saying that when you look at the third and fourth sentences, particularly the words in relation to the administrative court, which similarly, so referring back to 204, could resolve relevant factual disputes, that suggests that Lord Hodge had in mind a fact-finding jurisdiction which may include uh, um, proportionality. Well, wrote, again, separate judgment doesn't deal with this issue at all, is that right? No. And it wasn't the focus of but it's a very curious paragraph because if the authority is not willing to continue the provision of interim accommodation pending the review, then your remedy is judicial review. Yes. If the authority is willing to do that, decides not to take any decision until after your 204 appeal has been dealt with, you accept is judicial review. Yes. So when is 204 engaged? Well, your your accommodation is terminated during the review process, so between 184 and 202. But you're allowed to stay till the hearing. But you, as it happens, you remain in accommodation. By the time you lodge a 204 appeal, then, under Lord Hodge's ratio, you are making submissions about the proportionality. Yeah. But... Right. Yes. Um... Still on Rome 1, can, can, can I just come back to the Turkish example that my Lord Lord Justice B yes. raised? Um, because that is an obvious example of unlawful direct discrimination, why my Lord, my Lord raised it. Um, and whilst it would be right to say that the, that review could then be the subject of a claim under... Um, in, 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 under Part 9 of the Equality Act, under Section 114 and so forth. The point that was raised about to what extent that is an effective remedy to our dissatisfied Turkish applicant who wanted to live in Lewisham um, is, is right. And we then come to the extent to which the County Court, hearing the Part 7 claim, could cross the, the review decision. But the other point is, is, is this, that that review decision would be, I say, prima facie unlawful. And any lawyer looking at those plain words 
would be saying this is one discriminatory and two therefore unlawful because it is such a plain, plain example. It must therefore be the case that one can raise the unlawfulness within section 204 because that clear discrimination must taint or vitiate the whole of the review decision. I mean, are you envisaging that section 204 appeal comes on before the county court judge and is this, you know, saying, the, the, the occupied of the act is saying, I look, discriminate against because I'm Turkish. Mm. And the authorities say, no, that's a matter for a, a different tribunal. Yes. The judge says, come off it, Mr. So yes. It's so obviously unlawful. It, yes. You say, but if yes. you can do that, you would say it can resolve any other issue. Absolutely. So that's the clearest example of when a county court judge would, would certainly both say that and consider that he or she had jurisdiction to say that, um, because they take the jurisdiction of the appeal on the point of law arising from the review decision. They say there can be no question that this review decision is discriminatory. That means it is unlawful, and therefore I can quash the review decision under my Section 204 powers. Now, what one then leads, so if that is right... Well, it's hard to see how it would not I mean, be correct. You can see it, that the judge I mean, wouldn't like to be running an authority's point on that, on my Lord's example of the Turkish advocate. But uh, you know, if, you, if you appeared in front of a county court judge, he would uh, he says, well, this is a ridiculous suggestion, of course, it's discrimination. And, and, and of course, I'm oh, sorry. No, no, then, then <laughs> but technically, Mr. Underwood might be right again. It would have to be resolved somewhere else. But of, of, of course, the words, of course, it's discriminatory, are a more informal way of expressing what the authorities say, which is that the courts, as in, as in Malcolm, the courts will not uphold a... I'm trying to find Lord Bingham's exact exact words, forgive me. Um, but Lord Bingham puts it in, in Lewis and Malcolm at Tab 8, page 1409, where he says, the court cannot be required to give legal effect to acts prescribed as unlawful. Sorry, which page? 1409, did you say? 1409, tab 8. <coughs> and it's paragraph 19 at C. I would not, however, no. accede to, as it happens, Lewisham's cont contention accepted by the judge, rejected by the Court of Appeal, that a claim for position to which there is no defence under housing legislation can never be defeated even where the claim is shown to be discriminatory. Parliament has enacted that discriminatory acts prescribed by the 1995 Act are unlawful. And the court cannot be required to give legal effect to acts prescribed as unlawful. Yes, but, and that, this is, as you know, a very controversial decision, but it's not the only case in which the House of Lords or Supreme Court has said defendant can raise all sorts of things as a defence to a claim. Going back even further than this, ones with counsel in mind and mm. such like. But it's a bit of a leap from that to say that um, the uh, therefore you can you can brush aside objections to jurisdiction and, and actually um, in a in, in a statutory appeal on the section two point four. Uh, to say that um, I, I, the applicant, rely on uh, Equality Act sections um, 113 following or part, whichever one it is. Uh, sorry, uh, part 15. Section 15 uh, and 19, yes. Uh, sections yes. 15 and 19. I rely on that as a sword, not a shield. Yes. I mean, do you say it makes no difference? What I say is, um, first of all, my, my, lord, my lords have my submissions on the construction of section 113, subsection 3A of the Equality Act, yes. Judicial Review includes section 204. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if one then goes to the construction of the Housing Act and section 204, then the jurisdiction there is appeal to the county court on any point of law arising from the decision. And I say that where a decision 
is discriminate is dis contains direct discrimination, as in my lord's case, then that is an error of law. It is therefore unlawful, and therefore the 204 provides that jurisdiction. And it's unlawful because Lord Bingham said so in Malcolm, and that's just one example. Malcolm, of course, controversial on the comparator point. Um, and it's, and I'm bolstered by that, in that, by Lord Bingham's other ratio in Runebago, which we've come back to at tab five, where when he describes the full range of issue on judicial review, and it's tab five, page 439, paragraph seven, and he's saying that the county court's jurisdiction is appellant, it is in substance the same as that of the High Court in Judicial Review, approving the Nipa Begum. Thus, the court may not only quash the local authority, the authority's decision under Section 2043 if it's held to be if it is held to be vitiated by legal misdirection, procedural and proprietary or unfairness, or bias, or irrationality, or bad faith. And then also on um, where the findings are untenable and so forth. So, my lord. If it is the case that a review decision could be quashed on legal misdirection, which must be the case under Section 204, Lord Bingham says so, and that is a point of law arising from the review decision, then where you have a review decision that, is, that contains discrimination, I say that's legal misdi misdirection. Well, maybe the obvious sort of case one might be able to say my example of it council standing up in front of the county court judge and say, well, that's just irrational, I'm going to quash it on that basis. Well, it, you could also say it was perverse, yes. Um, and, yeah, and of course... Irrationally discriminatory. Yes. What I then have to meet is... My Lord Lord Justice Bean's example was, a, was a, a plain and obvious example in order to make the case. It is, of course, more difficult um, when one then goes into the issues of is there a protected characteristic? If there is a protected characteristic... Are we into a practice criterion and so forth? Um, and we've well, that's one difficulty. But the other yes. difficulty, and I de de deliberately chose an almost sort of facetiously obvious mm. case with no dispute of fact, mm. but where right. there's no, there's nothing in the review letter which amounts to a, an admission that my hypothetical Turkish applicant, uh, the, the Turkish nationality, has got anything to do with it. The review letter just says in in bland terms, we're, we're not prepared to review it. Ah, says the applicant, but um, I, I want the court to look into the incidence of grant and refusal of housing to um, uh, applicants in this borough. And if you look carefully, you will find that Turks seem to get a very bad deal. Um, therefore, the, the local authorities' uh, review decision there Apparently, there's nothing wrong with it, but in fact, it's it's tainted by um, discrimination, whether direct or indirect. Uh, I am a Turk. There's no dispute about that. Um, therefore, I want the county court judge on the section 204 appeal to deal with my allegation that the the borough's um, allocation policy is discriminatory against Turks. Now, how how does the how does the county court judge deal with that um, if Bob is still good law? Well, can I say three things? And the third one I will come to, to that, so I, I don't want to push this up. The first, the first is to simply make the point that if I'm right about the plain and obvious example, my Lord, my Lord Justice is Tur Turkish national, that that amounts to a decision that is tainted or vitiated by legal mis misdirection and therefore falls within section 204, then the jurisdiction is there. The problem is how to exercise it in more difficult cases. That's the first point. The second point is that when one does have more difficult cases, such as the facts before us, requiring a judge to consider on a point of law whether or not somebody has a protected characteristic that's relevant to the decision, and then whether or not there were the various aspects of either section 15 or section 19. A judge will normally 
be able to make that decision on the basis of the documents that were in front of the reviews officer. That may or may not involve additional written evidence, but that would be very unusual. And my Lord Justice Lewison made the point that in Adath Israel there was undisputed evidence about the distress that was caused to the Jewish and Muslim community by not being able to bury within 24 hours. Um, it was undisputed, but it was, it was written evidence. So I say that when one looks at the administrative court authorities dealing with discrimination in judicial review, there is a role for evidence. And on the whole, that, that, that is undisputed. It would be very rare indeed. And then one comes to my Lord Justice Bean's example of, of then seeking to not only raise the direct discrimination point you've, you've found against me because I'm Turkish, but the um, indirect discrimination point for the whole of the Turkish community. Not something I have instructions on, um, and therefore I am saying this as it were off the top of my head, but it would seem to me that trying to bring in the allocation policy within a 204 would be very difficult indeed, and that you would then be in a judicial review. The exception to that is if the review, the original decision that you requested a review of, and then the review decision specifically tried to, was, was specifically concerned with an aspect of the allocation policy. but to raise that very broad issue of indirect discrimination against the whole of the Turkish community in Lewisham would, that, that would probably be on be beyond that to That example have to be dealt with in the county court under the exclusive jurisdiction about discrimination under the Equality Act or not. Well, it would presumably be a challenge initially to the allocation scheme and therefore brought within under, under judicial review. <coughs> Yeah, it's possible. Absolutely. It's possible that one could use yeah, Part Seven yeah. proceedings, but no, no, no. it's such a broad point, yeah. um, and indeed that's exactly what we've seen with the challenges on residence requirements in allocation schemes. Um, is where one person, who's say an Irish traveller, um, is tr is challenging that, obviously on her own behalf, but also with implications for the rest of her community. So that. The challenge to the allocation scheme would probably be very difficult within 204 unless it was directly part of the decision on the homelessness application. So this hypothetical claimant could either um, uh, seek judicial review of the health policy or could bring an Equality Act claim in the county court saying you discriminated against me because I'm a Turk, although it doesn't say so on the face of the letter. But I say that is the reason why, and I claim damages. Yes. But what I want is to be housed under homelessness, and therefore I am not excluded from raising the direct discrimination against me as a ground of appeal against the review decision under Section 204. Well, what do you say to Mr Underwood's... I'm not sure whether his submission will be cycled up to the point that um, the county court has the power, uh, in, uh, exercising its Equality Act jurisdiction, has the power to quash a decision because it has all the powers of the High Court on judicial review. Yes, it, um, clearly 119 gives the, gives the county court to do uh, um, and anything that the administrative court can do in judicial review and therefore quashing. The question is what would then happen whether or not that quashing in a context outside of Section 204 um, would quash the, the 202 review decision. If a decision is quashed, it's quashed. It, it? must be quashed. Um, that, that is, the, it's, it's, a, it's an open point, my Lord, because of course nobody's tried to do it. No. Um, but as I understand it, the County Court, even under the Equality Act, does not have a judicial review jurisdiction. No, it has the remedy. Yeah. So the fact that the county court is given an express power to do what the high court can do on judicial review 
would suggest that whatever kind of claim is brought in the county court under the Equality Act, it can quash a decision. It does, and we don't know how it would exercise it yeah. in these circumstances when there is a concurrent jurisdiction under the Housing Act. And the point about the multiplicity of proceedings has, has, yeah. has been discussed and the difficulty of that. My Lords, those are my submissions under ground. Well, excuse me, one moment. Um, the multiplicity of proceedings point I've made, it's also the case, and it refers to Mr Underwood's point about the degree of protection that there is for defendants in Part 7 claims for damages, and possibly for quashing, that of course, precisely because of those protections, then the Part 7 claim is likely to take considerably longer than a Section 204 mm. appeal. And when one goes back to the early authorities, to, to Nipper Begum and Runa Begum, where they discuss Parliament's intention of setting up the Section 204 jurisdiction, removing it from the Administrative Court, um, then they specifically refer to it becoming a reasonably, I'm paraphrasing, but quick, reasonably practical and quick and simple remedy. Um, and although it is on a point of law, arguably it still is that, whereas disputed states, pleadings and so forth, disclosure will all take much longer. That is ground one. On ground two, can I deal first of all with a bed? And thank you, my Lord, for bringing it to our attention. This was a case where, again, as with my client, Mr Abed had turned down an offer of accommodation mm -hmm. um, made under section 193 and he had made she, I think. she I'm so sorry she had made various submissions as to why that that offer was unsuitable but by the time that it got to 204 appeal in front of the county court the single issue was that Westminster had followed an unlawful process in making the offer to her, to her because it did not assess the suitability of the accommodation for her needs before making the offer. And her counsel re replied, uh, uh, relied on um, Newham ex parte a jury number three, which was a judicial review and referred to the provision of temporary accommodation under section 188, rather than an offer of suitable accommodation made under section 193. Mm. The submissions are at paragraph 18. For the appellant, Mr Gannon contends that Mr Justice Collins correctly identified the duty on the authority to make proper inquiries about issues affecting suitability. So that's the reference to Newham ex parte o jury. He argued, I'm going to the third sentence. He argued in the present case, Westminster had made proper inquiries about the factors relevant to the existence or otherwise of the duty under section 104, which I think must be a typing error for probably section 206. Mr Underwood's nodding. However, no inquiries were made in advance of making the offer or none that were worth regard as to the factors that were relevant and the suitability of the accommodation. That failure, he contended, rendered the decision unlawful and, as he put it, initially and incurably flawed. Um, and, of course, Mr Underwood then relies on that to, to make his temporal point that actions or omissions that arose before the original decision cannot be subject to an appeal under section 204. The, the well, that seems to be what Lord Justice Lloyd says at paragraph 26, isn't it? Well, what, what, he, says at uh, what he says at 26, he makes the point <coughs> from the third sentence onwards, the ob observations in a jury have no relevance to a case of statutory review processes available. In such a case, the Act has provided for the applicant to challenge the decision, have it fully reconsidered with the opportunity to ensure that the full facts are taken into account. That seems to me to exclude as illegitimate a challenge such as the original process was incorrect or even unlawful, because a point of that kind is superseded by the question as to whether the review process was carried out properly and reached a legally correct solution. That's the way Lord Justice Lloyd puts it, but it's not the way that the submissions have been focused. The submissions have been focused on inquiries. 
um, as one reads paragraphs 18 and 19. Well, that may be, but isn't 26 what this court decided? Well, what this court is not considering, so it decides it in the context of submissions as two inquiries, um, and in that respect, then Miss Abed runs straight into the Cramp and Hastings issue. Um, that that point about an assessment of suitability had not been raised during the review process. Yeah, well, that's another point they, that this Abbott makes at paragraph 19. Yes. The reviewing office could hardly be criticised for not having addressed the adequacy of the initial process if it hadn't been called into question. It hadn't been called into question. Um, and as I say, one runs directly into, into Cramp and Hastings, and whilst the, authority, the duty on the authorities to make all necessary inquiry, then a local authority will not be criticised for failing to make an inquiry which is not obvious, which an applicant doesn't raise during the review process. So that's how it was argued. Um, Lord Justice Lloyd, yes, appears to take the point further and to take the temporal point um, that Mr Underwood, Underwood is pressing on you. Um, but I say, first of all, that the point that we've been arguing about today as to whether that would exclude consideration of all policies, including a policy adopted some six months before the review decision about the allocation of temporary accommodation, whether that's right. Yeah. Um, because that, that, that issue is simply not explored. Right. And if we then go from Ebed and we step back and consider Mr Underwood's temporal point, I agree that where there is a review decision, there cannot similarly be a collateral attack on the contents of a Section 184 decision. And that's the, the, the decision in, in William and Wandsworth at paragraph 55. Mr Underwood agrees that if an applicant in my client's position raises during the review process a point about policy, and the review officer deals with it, that that point would then be subject to an appeal on a point of law. I think that's right. So we are in the position of considering what is the jurisdiction under section 204, where the reviews officer applies a policy and it's not being considered, discussed, raised during the review process. And that could be two sorts of policies. It could be, as in this case, something that is not written down, not firmly adopted as a policy, is generally considered as a practice, normal practice and so forth. Or you could have a much more obvious policy decision, probably made by elected councillors, and again, the most obvious example is the allocation of temporary accommodation. I don't have to raise the point in this anymore. And the other ones are the contracting out um, decisions. And the difficulty with Mr Underwood's temporal point is if, the allocation, if, if a policy about the allocation of temporary accommodation was made six months a year before somebody in Ms Adesutu's position had to refer to it, then we submit it would be profoundly wrong that she did not have, if that policy contained unlawful aspects, that she didn't have the chance to challenge that within a 204. The alternative is either that she challenged a judicial, by way of judicial review, within three months of the adoption of the policy, and as I say, no, it would be unlikely that she wouldn't know that she was caught by that policy, mm. or alternatively, she starts a section 204, appeal and at the same time applies for permission to bring judicial review with an extension um, with, 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 with an extension of time beyond the three months assuming it is beyond the three months. We say that, that those are clearly not effective remedies, would lead to a multiplicity of procedures and it must also be the case as in Brent and Ali, Ali, Ali Bicat and, and, and Brent that actually the decision on review about the suitability of temporary accommodation is a 
applying the policy, whether or not she has raised the lawfulness of the policy during the review decision, the reviews officer will be applying the policy, in the case of Ali Bickett, um, how to determine which families were sent out of London and so forth. The reviews officer may or may not explicitly say in the review, I have applied the policy. I would suggest that if he does say that in review, then that does mean that there is a ground of appeal available against, against that. And it would be absurd that if he failed to mention the policy in his review, but did actually impliedly apply it, as it would, as, as Brent Council did for Mr Ali Bickett, it would be observed if Mr Ali Bickett, probably not legally represented during the review process, could not then challenge a possible unlawfulness of the policy. And so we say that the real danger with Mr Underwood's temporal analysis of Section 204 is that whilst some of it is right, particularly focusing on the contents of the Section 184 decision, it must be wrong that if a policy is applied during the review stage, it can only be challenged if during the review stage the applicant has actually raised that challenge. That must be wrong. If it is applied at the review stage and there is an, and there is an arguable error of law with it, it must be right that it can then be raised within Section 204. Can I just say, um, mm. this is unorthodox, um, no. um, but um, it may help to clarify matters. I, I, I do not suggest that if a policy is applied by the review officer and is applied incorrectly, that the point of law arising from that cannot be raised in a 204 appeal. I accept that it can. But the, the, the distinguishing point is, it is a policy, as we said in our written submissions, that is applied in her case. By contrast with Tashi, for example, where in fact... The, the fact that the decision-making process had been contracted out was simply not something that the review, a review officer considered or applied in that particular case. There is a material distinction there. That's very helpful. And all I would si simply say is that what is important, given Mr Underwood's um, explanation there, is that the ability to an attack a policy that's relevant should be there, whether it is clearly clear from the words in the review decision the policy has been considered or it is also implicit that the policy has been yeah. considered. That there has I mean, been there, considered. There is, there's another way of looking at this possibly which um, in a sense doesn't go to jurisdiction um, but we mustn't forget that subject to your arguments about what judicial review means in the Equality Act the process under section 204 is described in the Housing Act as an appeal. Yes. Um, and it's normal practice in appeals that you can't raise new points on appeal which you didn't take below. I mean, that's the way it works, almost always. Yes. Now, that doesn't go necessarily to jurisdiction no. in, the, in the strict formal sense, but it goes to what an appeal court would allow to be argued, which is sort of jurisdiction in a rather loose sense. Well, yes, but it can't... I mean, for example, the test of... of the, the, the review decision still has to be lawful yes. to survive a 204. And so, for example, um, the, an unrepresented ap applicant faced with a decision that she's not vulnerable um, would be unlikely to say, you've applied the test in Penny 02 wrong during her review process. She's more likely to say, this is what is wrong with me. But if she's not raised a Penny 02 test, if she's not sought to address it, then if the review decision then applies the Panio 2 test wrong, wrongly, it would be completely wrong for her to be prevented from pointing out that legal mis misdirection. Um, and so I, what I'm saying is that if the policy is applied explicitly or implicitly in a review decision that affects that applicant, then, um, then it would be legal mis misdirection. The, the, she is entitled to raise well, no, I can whether see or that. So legal the applicant, the applicant says this is what is wrong with me and the reviewing officer decides that she either is or isn't in priority need and gets the test wrong 
uh, I can see that, that, that what is wrong with me was raised. But if the applicant says, doesn't say, I needed more time to make my mind up, and so the review officer doesn't consider whether that's so or not, then you may be faced with the, the point, not that there is a legal error, because the point was never raised. Um, and I entirely accept it's not for the applicant, particularly the unrepresented applicant, to argue points of law. Mm. One might say it's up to the applicant to tell the reviewing officer what facts, she says, are relevant to her case. It is, but it's also the case that the reviewing officer has to, con has to obviously, consider the legal test. Mm. In this case, it was the legal test at section 193, subsection 5. And so, within that, the reviewing officer has to decide whether or not she was informed of the possible consequence of refusal or acceptance, and the right to request review, whether she refused an offer of accommodation, whether it was um, suitable for the applicant. And within that, they, we would say, and we would bring on the Section 204 appeal, they would have to consider whether, having been informed, whether she had a reasonable period to consider the offer. And there is some guidance in the code that there should be a reasonable period. It doesn't say what. So the reviewing officer is familiar with the code, he or she is familiar with the with, with the statute. They have they have to consider it. Um, those are my submissions on the ground two point. Yeah. And as with Mr. Underwood, I, I refer your lordships to my written submissions. If there's anything that I failed to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. <coughs> Well, thank you both very much for your interesting arguments. Uh, you've given us plenty to think about. You will go away and think about it. Um, you will get a draft judgment or judgments in the usual way, which will be your opportunity to correct our spelling and grammar, but not to re-argue the case. Uh, we would hope that in the light of the draft, um, you will be able to agree a form of order. Uh, if you can't agree a form of order, please make submissions on what you say the order should be in writing. We will adjudicate on that on the papers, so there need be no, there need be no attendance on the hand down. Uh, and a word of warning: we are close to the end of term, so don't hold your breath. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice.